I want to talk now with uh, my old friend Dan Boltz, Boltz who is uh, the chief uh, political editor over at uh, the Washington Post. And he and uh, Haynes Johnson, a uh, longtime Post reporter and, uh, and an author of many books, have just written a new book called The Battle for America 2008. It is a wonderful book. It's, uh, it's an account of uh, what I think is one of the most interesting campaigns, uh, certainly in all the campaigns that I've covered. Uh, Dan, uh, welcome, and I must say, this was quite a job, wasn't it? Because I remember when all those Teddy Kennedy, uh, Teddy uh, White books came out, uh, we got this great behind the scenes view of what was going on in politics, but now there's so much coverage, there's almost not very much going on behind the scenes. It's all out in front of the scenes. How in the world were you able to put together this book and come up, because there are some things in here that uh, I'll tell you for sure, I didn't know, but it, it's, it's a hard job these days, isn't it? Well, there's no question about that, Bob, and, and, and thank you. Um, it, uh, you know, these campaigns are covered at, at such a level of minutia. Um, our goal actually starting out was not to think of this book as totally an inside book. I mean, we wanted to try to elevate it. Uh, we felt that this was going to be a very important campaign for the country. The country was certainly at a turning point when the campaign began after the unpopularity of the wars in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and the, an economy beginning to weaken, though it got much worse throughout the campaign. Uh, Haynes's sense and my sense both were that this was a campaign worthy of a book. Um, we obviously had no idea when we got into it just how interesting and, and uh, dramatic the campaign would turn out to be. Um, and, but in any campaign there are things that you can pry out once once events have moved on and we were able to do that and I think we were able to pull together uh, both in uh, interviews that we did including a really revealing interview with uh, President-elect Obama in 2008 in December uh, six weeks after his election but also with the top advisors for all the campaigns so uh, we think there's a lot of fresh material we like to think that we've been able to create a sense of suspense uh, on a story in which most people uh, generally do know the whole story and particularly how it ends. You got some very interesting stuff uh, on the other side, on the Republican side too, I thought especially about uh, uh, Sarah Palin. Uh, when you finally came down to it, why do you think that uh, John McCain uh, decided to pick Sarah Palin? Bob, I think there are three reasons that he made that decision. The first, uh, and I think the most uh, obvious is, at the time they had to make a selection, they were convinced they were going to lose the election unless they did something dramatic to shake it up. They needed to, in one way or another, change the trajectory uh, of an election that was heading towards Barack Obama and the Democrats just because the country was unhappy, it was in a mood for change, it was tired of the Bush presidency, uh, it had already voted the Republicans out of power in Congress. So that was one reason. They just feared they were going to lose if they didn't do something dramatic. Second reason was they were, they were not doing well with women. John McCain was not getting enough of the women's vote for them to feel they had a chance of winning. Their hope was that if they picked a woman uh, that uh, that might help them reach out to disaffected female voters who had supported Hillary Clinton and were not that uh, um, likely to vote for uh, Barack Obama. I think that was a strategic miscalculation frankly but I think that went into it. And third, I think McCain saw in Sarah Palin somebody who he believed was like himself, which is to say somebody who was a reformer at heart. And I think he wanted to be able to run as somebody who would go and shake up Washington. She had defeated an incumbent governor of her own party when she was elected governor, and I think McCain thought that she would be a fellow uh, reformer and that they could sell the ticket in a way that Americans had not looked at him uh, through most of the campaign. And now, uh, this part is not in your book, of course, but now we have this situation where Sarah Palin is just the latest in a number of politicians who have left office before their term was up. This is kind of a new trend, it seems to me. Why, 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 why do you think that's happening? It, it, it is a new trend. It's, it's, it's not a good trend, frankly. I mean, I think when people sign on to be, you know, governors or senators or whatever, uh, that they have an obligation to fill that term unless there are truly extraordinary circumstances. But the idea of kind of walking away from the job, I thought Sarah Palin's uh, explanation for it, which is that she was trying to uh, spare Alaska from lame duck politics, was in many ways a kind of a lame rationale 
for doing it, but we're seeing it more and more. It's almost as if these jobs become awfully tedious, and I can understand that you know, in, a, in the environment, the pol polarized environment we're in, in the media environment we're in, that, uh, that it can be difficult to do it, but I don't think it's a healthy trend. Well, I mean, to just today, Governor Chris down in Florida is appointing a replacement for Mel Martinez, the senator who right. uh, down there decided not to finish out his term. Uh, former House Speaker Denny Hastert decided he would leave before it was all over. It's almost uh, like, uh, well, uh, I don't have much future here, so why should I keep on with it? And I, I, I have to say that I agree with you. I think it is not uh, a very healthy trend. What do you think, uh, getting back to your book, Dan, in the end uh, was the reason that Barack Obama was able to defeat Hillary Clinton because we had these two very different uh, ideas about how you get the nomination, two very well-funded candidates, two uh, very well-known candidates. But in the end, it seems to me, he just ran a better campaign than she did. Why, why do you think, why do you think that was? Well, Bob, you're, you're absolutely right. He did run a better campaign. Uh, I would say this, that the first big reason was her vote uh, for the Iraq War resolution. Um, I think that that was something that opened up the uh, liberal activist wing of the party to Senator Obama when he was running, and it was a big, big factor in it. I think the second is that um, at critical points in the campaign, her operation foundered and his operation soared. Uh, they understood how to uh, maneuver through the caucuses far more effectively than she did. They understood the calendar. They understood the, the delegate selection process. All things you would have thought that the mighty Clinton network and machine would have known uh, how to do better than, than Obama. And third, I think that Obama, which is the key of all good and successful candidates, frankly, uh, understood the mood of the country and was able to speak to it more effectively than she was. She was, uh, she had a lot of attributes and in the end, Bob, as you know, she turned into a very, very strong candidate. Um, but, uh, but I think that Obama, through the course of that campaign, was able to seize the mood and, and uh, identify it and speak to it more effectively than she. I think you're exactly right. It is the candidate always who seizes the mood, who catches the mood of the country at exactly that moment, uh, who, who winds up winning. And in this case, we saw it was Barack Obama. Uh, Dan, uh, really enjoyed your book. Uh, hope you sell a bunch of them. Thanks for being with us this Thanks morning. Thanks so much.